Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Deanna and I make videos about mental health. So without further ado, let's get started on this PIP and mental health video. And trying to remain so strong, I know it's good if I'm wrong, I got it, I got it. So in today's video, I am going to be showing you and telling you a few things that you can do to help yourself to get a good PIP claim. So for those of you who don't know, PIP is a benefit within the United Kingdom. It is there to help those who suffer with physical or mental health illnesses. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking through some of the categories in the actual form and talking about how you can answer them for mental health. So just a bit of context, I myself do claim PIP. I claim it on the basis of physical health and mental health. So I have a bit of background understanding as to how I personally answered the questions for both sides of things. I'm gonna be talking today about the mental health side. So without further ado, let's actually get into the video. So getting PIP with a mental health diagnosis and nothing else on your record, just mental health, is actually really hard. And historically, it was even harder. So I wanna talk about some of the ways that you can answer the questions and questions you can ask yourself in order to improve your chances of getting PIP. So this, this is in no way an advice video in terms of like, I'm not qualified to make this advice. I'm going off all of my personal experience. When I applied for PIP, PIP said it's not about the diagnosis. They said it was not about the diagnosis, but it was about how the diagnosis affects your daily life. And as much as I believe a certain amount of that is true, I also believe that the diagnosis does play a part. So if I use the example of one of my physical health conditions, when I applied for PIP, and this was when I originally applied and got turned down, I had fibromyalgia. And for any of those who were diagnosed with fibromyalgia or are diagnosed with fibromyalgia, you know that fibromyalgia doesn't just affect your physical health, but it also affects your mental health because it is a debilitating pain condition. However, PIP did not see it like that. PIP saw it as, you know, all the things that are like, fibromyalgia is, is also seen as a condition that is given to a lot of people because they don't have arthritis. So I was tested for arthritis and I didn't have arthritis. I had various ultrasounds on my hands, my knees, my wrist joints and all those bits and pieces and there was no arthritis found. So therefore I was given fibromyalgia. At the time I was very happy to have the diagnosis to kind of, I thought I was being recognised. But in hindsight, I know that fibromyalgia is usually given because there's no other diagnosis. But now I am diagnosed with chronic lower back pain of the L5 to S1. And if you'd like me to get more into that video of how the pain affects mental health, then I'm happy to do that. But let's go ahead and get into the questions. So if I look down, it's because I've got all my notes on my notebook and I would not be able to remember everything without a notebook. So I'm gonna start off with making food. So in this section, you are asked questions such as, can you make a meal and make and prepare a meal unaided? So the PIP questions are very much tailored towards a physical health condition. But under the making food category, you could ask yourself, do you remember to cook for yourself? And does someone prompt or remind you to cook? Because that is also under the uh, under the category of you can't make food yourself or 50% of the time do you remember to cook but the other 50% of the time you're put off eating because you physically or mentally don't have the capacity to actually make those decisions about food. Do you not eat food at a... Do you use the food and you don't eat it at good times? Like for breakfast, do you have like pasta for example because you know you don't really have a concept about when you're meant to eat different types of food the other thing under making food is do i know how to cook a simple meal like pasta and sauce on my own so this doesn't need necessarily need to be physically it can also be mentally so do you know adequate portion control or do you suffer with an eating disorder that might make you have less of a portion because that's what your brain is telling you to do so you can bring up eating disorders in this because you can say that I either overeat or under eat and then obviously nutritional wise you're not getting what you should be getting. So the next section I'm going to talk about is getting treatment. So do you remember to take all your medication or do you need prompting in order to take that medication? If you don't have someone to prompt you, do you use a dosset box? Do you have an aid or an alarm or something that you use to remember to take your medication? Because that all counts under getting treatment because if you didn't have those aids, appliances or people would you remember to take your medication? When your mental health starts to decline, do you stop taking your medication? Do you have the ability to seek help when your mental health starts to decline? Or does it decline so much that you need intervention from services without maybe your knowledge or without your prior consent? 
those sorts of things would all count towards the help that you would need or help that you may need for getting treatment. Also under getting treatment, do any of your medications that you take cause side effects? So do you get extreme tiredness? Does that affect your daily life in the ability to go shopping? Or does it affect your daily life in the ability to exercise and socialise with people? And I will talk more about socialising as a topic in a little bit later in this video. The next thing that is on the form that I wanted to mention is washing and bathing. So these sections usually are for people who cannot either get in and out of a bath on their own or they can't shower parts of their body on their own. But actually, in a mental health sense, do you remember to have a shower? And that may seem stupid, but for those of you who have depression or those of you who have anxiety or those of you who even have like OCD, you might over shower, you might have three or four showers a day, causing your body to have like redness because you've scrubbed your body so hard because of the obsession to be clean. On the other scale of things, if you're depressed, you might not shower for two weeks. Does your hair become matted if you don't shower and you don't brush your hair because you're depressed? Do you need prompting to get into the shower to have a shower? And also when thinking about this, how often do you require prompting? How often do these depression episodes happen to the point where you need somebody to intervene in order for you to bathe? The next thing following on from that is dressing and undressing. So for this, do you wear appropriate clothes for the weather? If it's going to be chucking down rain outside, do you remember to take your raincoat or an umbrella? Or do you just think that a hoodie will be enough? And you do that because you don't think to take a raincoat. Do you wear appropriate clothes in the day? Do you ever go out in your pyjamas? And not just because you feel like it, but because you forget to get dressed or something like that. Do you have the ability to be able to pick a matching outfit? Or do you require somebody to say that top matches with those bottoms? Do you remember to wear all necessary types of clothing? So do you ever forget a bra? Like not because you have chosen not to wear a bra, but do you ever forget a bra? Do you ever forget to put knickers on? Things like that. The next thing I wanna bring up is speaking. So can you speak to others all the time or do you require somebody to help you to communicate? Does your anxiety ever prevent you from communicating? Do you ever go mute? Do you need a friend or family member to speak on your behalf? And this could be for a number of reasons. This could be because you've got selective mutism or it could be because you're in a social situation and you get too anxious to speak. All of those would go under speaking. The next thing I'm gonna bring up is reading and understanding. Do you have dyslexia? Because that also comes under the mental well-being and mental health. Can you always read the words and understand them or because of the, dys the dyslexia or dyspraxia or anything that you have, do you require somebody to explain something several times in order for you to understand it. The next topic is socialising. So are you able to make friends and socialise with them regularly? Can you understand body language? Because I know for a fact that I can't understand body language half the time. If I'm talking to a friend on FaceTime, it's slightly easier because I can see how their body is responding to certain things I say. But if they're just over text... I don't know what their body language is like and even if I do have that piece of the puzzle about body language half the time I still don't know what they're intending and the way that they're thinking and things like that and that can that cause you to go into an anxiety spiral because I know that I do I go into anxiety spirals when I don't know whether if something I've said has annoyed somebody can you communicate and socialize within a group situation I know that I can communicate and I can socialise in a group situation, but I sometimes become too anxious to do that. And when I become too anxious to do that, I sometimes will cancel plans and I won't go out because I'm too anxious to go into that group situation. Does socialising ever give you anxiety? And if so, how often does it give you anxiety? Because Pip will ask you how often it gives you anxiety. So do you find that in a two week period, do you find that a week out of that two week period, you can't socialise, that you stay in your flat or your bedroom because you can't socialise with others around you? Or do you find that 75% of the time, so a week and a half out of two weeks, you can't socialise because you don't have the ability to actually do that. Do you socialise on your own or do you require somebody to prompt you to actually socialise? So are you the person who's always wanting socialisation or do you require somebody to say, do you want to meet up? Do you want to go out and have dinner or do you want to socialise? Because I know that sometimes I can go from hibernating and not wanting to socialise with anybody or I can be the complete opposite and I can go to over wanting to socialise to the point where I blab and I talk too much about things and I have times where I will talk talk the ears off people because I'm overcompensating for my anxiety. 
Also, if you do socialise, do you require a support worker, a friend or a family member to help you to attend those sessions of socialisation? Like, if you're going to meet up with somebody who you don't really know very well, do you require somebody to be there that you know more? Or do you require a support worker to be in the vicinity? Like, if you're going shopping with a friend, do you sometimes require a support worker to be in the same town? Not necessarily with you and your friend, but do you require somebody to be in the same town so if you needed somebody, you could literally just call them and they'd be in there within five minutes? And do you have ever have to cancel plans because of a bad day, mental health or anxiety-wise? Do you ever have to text somebody and say, I'm really sorry, but I can't do today because I'm so anxious and it's nothing to do with that person, it's just a bad day. The next and last thing is money. So do you remember to pay your bills or do you require somebody to help you to pay and understand how to pay your bills? Can you budget and spend money with inside that budget or do you impulsively spend? And do you impulsively spend to the point that you get yourself into debt? So that is it for my tips and questions to ask yourself. Hopefully that will allow you to gain some understanding and to help you to have a bit more of a successful PIP claim because I know that I had PIP when I was younger. I then applied for PIP again, got rejected and spent two years without PIP because I was rejected and then I appealed it, got rejected and had to go to tribunal. So if this video can help anybody to understand how to answer a PIP form, just with mental health then I've done my purpose in this video. So at the point of filming this video to get PIP standard you need 8 to 11 points and to get PIP ad enhanced you need 12 plus points. PIP is also made up into two sections the mobility component and the daily living component. Because it's mental health I focus mainly on the daily living component. Please also know that within each question there are different levels of answers so in one question you might get four points, in another question you might get two, in another question you might get zero but it's the total number of points allocated over all the questions and the total for the daily living as to whether you will get the the pip or the enhanced pip but thank you very much for watching please leave a comment if this has helped you at all in this video or if this has helped you to help a loved one to be able to answer their pip claim appropriately for mental health but thank you very much for watching and i shall see you in my next one bye just like you're young again no don't you cry just get back up again